Hey kids, Mr. D here. We are going to start our study of The Great Gatsby. And this is the first part of chapter one. In my younger and more vulnerable years, my father gave me some advice that I've been turning over in my head ever since. Whenever you feel like criticizing anyone, he told me, just remember that all the people in this world haven't had the advantages that you've had. He didn't say any more, but we've always been unusually communicative in a reserved way, and I understood that he meant a great deal more than that. In consequence, I'm inclined to reserve judgments a habit that has opened up many curious natures to me and also made me the victim of not a few veteran bores. So right off the bat, we learn some interesting stuff about Nick. Let's make this a little bigger. Number one. Nick makes a point not to judge people. Okay. And in consequence, people tell Nick their secrets. The abominable mind is quick to detect and attach itself to this quality when it appears in a normal person, and so it came about that in college I was unjustly, unjustly accused of being a politician because I was privy to the secret griefs of wild, unknown men. All right? So, same thing here. Most of the confidences were unsought. Frequently, I have feigned sleep, preoccupation, or a hostile levity when I realized, by some unmistakable sign, that an intimate revelation was quivering on the horizon. For the intimate revelations of young men, or at least the terms in which they express them, are usually plagiaristic and marred by obvious suppressions. Reserving judgment is a matter of infinite hope. So this idea of hope is going to come up a lot in the novel. Okay? So we want to be on the lookout for mentions of hope okay i also want to point out here nick doesn't seek out the secrets of men right all right he doesn't seek to learn people's secrets They just tell him. Right? He's saying that there's something in him that people can identify, and it's almost they like can tell that he won't judge them, so they pour their hats out to him. All right, so reserving judgment is a matter of infinite hope. I am still a little afraid of missing something if I forget that, as my father snobbishly suggested, and I snobbishly repeat, that a sense of the fundamental decencies is parceled out unequally at birth. Okay? Basically, what he's saying here is not everyone has the same idea about what is right and what is wrong. Right? Common decency is not equally distributed to people upon birth. Some people have it, some people don't. And after boasting of myself, excuse me, and after boasting this way of my tolerance, I come to the admission that it has a limit. All right, my tolerance has a limit. So he will, I guess, eventually judge. Conduct may be founded on the hard rock or the wet marshes, but after a certain point, I don't care what it's founded on. When I came back from the East last autumn, I felt that I wanted the world to be in uniform and at a sort of moral attention forever. All right, so what happened to him? This is the question. What happened 
that Nick left the East longing for morality. What happened that was so terrible that this man whose primary, you know, way of looking at the world is to not judge people, what caused him to make this judgment that he had had enough, that he was leaving, and that he wanted things to be moral? What happened? Hmm. I wanted no more riotous excursions with privileged glimpses into the human heart. Only Gatsby... The man who gives his name to this book was exempt from my reaction. Gatsby, who represented everything for which I have an unaffected scorn. So this is interesting, right? He obviously was making judgments, but why was, Gats why was Gatsby exempt? Who represented... Everything Nick hates. Exempt from his judgment. Right? He tries not to judge people, but eventually he does. But why was Gatsby exempt? If personality is an unbroken series of successful gestures, then there was something gorgeous about him, some heightened sensitivity to the promises of life, as if he were related to one of those intricate machines that register earthquakes 10,000 miles away. This responsiveness had nothing to do with that flabby impressionability which is dignified under the name of creative temperament. It was an extraordinary gift for hope. There's that word again. A romantic readiness such as which I have never found in any other person and which it is not likely I shall ever find again. All right. So why is Gatsby exempt? His capacity for hope. Hmm. He goes on, no, Gatsby turned out all right at the end. It is what preyed on Gatsby. What foul dust floated in the wake of his dreams that temporarily closed out my interest in the abortive sorrows and short-winded elations of men. So this is an interesting question. So let's look at this word, preyed. Let me do this. What preyed on Gatsby? What does preyed mean, right? Predator and prey, essentially what hunted him? Right? What was it? What preyed on Gatsby? What did Nick see as hunting Gatsby? An interesting way to start. All right, so now Nick's going to talk about himself a little bit. My family have been prominent, well-to-do people in the Middle Western, in this Middle Western city for three generations. Okay? What does this tell us? Nick is old money. The Caraways are something of a clan, and we have a tradition that we're descended from the Dukes of Bouchelou or whatever. But the actual founder of my line was my grandfather's brother, who came here in 1851, sent a substitute to the Civil War, and started the wholesale hardware business that my father carries on today. This, even right here, is evidence that they've been wealthy for quite some time. During the Civil War, if you were drafted in to go, you could actually pay to have somebody else go for you. All right? So this is evidence of Nick's family wealth. I never saw this great uncle, but I'm supposed to look like him, with special reference to the rather hard-boiled painting that hangs in father's office. I graduated from New Haven in 1915. So when he talks about New Haven, what he means is Yale. He went to Yale. 
Just a quarter of a century after my father, and a little later, I participated in that delayed Teutonic migration known as the Great War. The Great War is World War I. I enjoyed the counter raid so thoroughly that I came back restless. Instead of being the warm center of the world, the Middle West now seemed like the ragged edge of the universe, so I decided to go east and learn the bond business. Everybody I knew was in the bond business, so I suppose it could support one more single man. All of my aunts and uncles talked it over as if they were choosing a prep school for me and finally said, why, yes, with very grave, hesitant faces. Father agreed to finance me for a year, and after various delays, I came east permanently, I thought, in the spring of 22. So, what is this telling us here? Nick is from the Midwest. He moved to New York in 1922 to get into the bond business, right? He was going to be a bond trader or a broker, but however you please. So this is why Nick ends up in New York this summer. Okay, now he said that he thought when he moved out here that he'd be moving permanently, but obviously something happens, we know, right, up here, um, right, obviously something happened that Nick left, and that's what we're going to find out in the story. Mm -hmm. Continuing right here. The practical thing was to find rooms in the city, but it was a warm season, and I had just left a country of wide lawns and friendly trees. So when a young man at the office suggested that we take a house together in a commuting town, it sounded like a great idea. He found the house, a weather-beaten cardboard bungalow at 80 a month, and at the last minute, the firm ordered him to Washington, and I went out to the country alone. I had a dog, at least I had him for a few days until he ran away, and an old Dodge, and a Finnish woman who made my bed and cooked breakfast, and muttered Finnish wisdom to herself over the electric stove. It was lonely for a day or so until one morning some man, more recently arrived than I, stopped me on the road. How do you get to West Egg Village? He asked helpless, helplessly. I told him, and as I walked on, I was lonely no longer. I was a guide, a pathfinder, an original settler. He had casually conferred on me the freedom of the neighborhood. So something I want to point out, um, this right here, this is how Nick ends up living on West Egg. Right, because West Egg is the new money side, but he's old money. So this is, that, that explains how he ended up there. Okay. Right here. We're going to start right here. And so with the sunshine and the great bursts of leaves growing on the trees, just as things grow in fast movies, I had that familiar conviction that life was beginning over again with the summer. There was so much to read, for one thing, and so much fine health to be pulled down out of the young, breath-giving air. I bought a dozen volumes on banking and credit and investment securities, and they stood on my shelf in red and gold like new money from the mint, promising to unfold the shining secrets that only Midas and Morgan and Masonius knew. And I had the high intention of reading many other books besides. I was rather literary in college. One year, I wrote a series of very solemn and obvious editorial for the Yale News. And now I was going to bring back all such things into my life and become once again the most limited of all specialists, the well-rounded man. This isn't just an epigram. Life is much more successfully looked at from a single window, after all. It was a matter of chance that I should have rented a house in one of the strangest communities in North America. It was on that slender, riotous island which extends itself due east of New York and where there are, among other natural curiosities, two unusual formations of land. Twenty miles from the city, a pair of enormous eggs... Identical in contour and separated only by a courtesy bay, jut out into the most domesticated body of salt water in the Western Hemisphere, the great wet barnyard of the Long Island Sound. They're not perfect ovals like the egg in the Columbus story. They are both crushed flat at the contact end, but their physical resemblance must be a source of perpetual confusion to the gulls that fly overhead. To the wingless and more arresting phenomenon is their dissimilarity in every particular way except shape and size. So what we're learning here, 
All right, now he says eggs. They're not actual eggs. They're little peninsulas sticking out of Long Island. So East Egg. And West Egg. Look very similar on the surface. But couldn't be more different. So says Nick. He says, I lived at West Egg, the well less fashionable of the two. Though this is a most superficial tag to express the bizarre and not a little sinister contrast between. So let's look at his diction here. Diction is word choice. So he describes um, the, the eggs as bizarre, sinister. All right? So we ask ourselves. All right, so he lived at West Egg, which we know is the new money side. What is so bizarre and sinister? About the eggs. All right, so we're looking at diction here. All right, bizarre, sinister. My house was at the very tip of the egg, only 50 yards from the sound, and squeezed between two huge places that rented for 12 or 15,000 a season. The one on my right was a colossal affair by any standard. It was a factual imitation of some Hotel de, no de Ville in Normandy, with a tower on one side spanking new under a thin beard of raw ivy, and a marble swimming pool, and more than 40 acres of lawn and garden. Right, now here's the thing. So let's look at the description here. Um, okay. It was a factual imitation of some Hotel de Ville in Normandy, a tower on one side, spanking new under thin beer broad ivy, a marble swimming pool, more than 40 acres of lawn and a garden. Now, this is, sounds very nice, very rich, very luxurious, but this one little clue here, right, under a thin beard of raw ivy, tells us that this is new, all right? This is a new money estate. Right? So if you look up the Hotel de Ville in Normandy, you'll see it's very ornate, very carved, you know, gold and gilded and, you know, super, super designed, we'll say. Um, this would have been very typical or would be very typical of, you know, a quote unquote new money person. They're showing off their wealth and everything's got to be filigreed and covered in gold and everything else. Okay. Now, this was Gatsby's mansion. Or rather, as I didn't know, Mr. Gatsby, it was a mansion inhabited by a gentleman of that name. My house was an eyesore, but it was a small eyesore, and it had been overlooked. So I had a view of the water, a partial view of my neighbor's lawn, and the consoling proximity of millionaires, all for $80 a month. So, that is Gatsby's mansion. Um... As we read on, pay attention to the description of Tom and Daisy's house. Tom and Daisy are old money. See how much more refined their house sounds. He says, across the courtesy bay, the white palaces of fashionable East Egg glittered along the water. Right, the white palaces of fashionable East Egg glittered along the water. Okay, East Egg, old money. And the history of the summer really begins on the evening I drove over there to have dinner with the Tom Buchanans. Daisy was my second cousin once removed, and I had known Tom in college. And just after the war, I spent two days with them in Chicago. All right, so Nick knows Tom and Daisy. All right, he's Daisy's cousin. He went to college with Tom. He spent some time with him in the past. These are people familiar to him, all right? Which makes sense because they exist in the same old money world. Her husband of unvarious physical accomplishments had been one of the most powerful ends that played ever played football at New Haven. A national figure in a way, one of those men who reached such an acute limited excellence at 21 that everything afterwards savors of anti-climax. So this is interesting. Now, 
Tom, um, he is described as one of those men who reached such an acute limited excellence at 21 that everything afterwards savors of anticlimax. Basically what he's saying is Tom peaked in college. Right? He's very wealthy. In fact, it says right here, his family were enormously wealthy. Um, he's wealthy, he went to Yale, he was a very good football player, and he kind of like achieved a low level of fame because of it. And ever since college, nothing, Tom's never really had that same level of notoriety, right? Um, even in college, his freedom with money was a matter for reproach. But now he'd left Chicago and come east in a fashion that rather took your breath away. For instance, he'd brought down a string of polo ponies from Lake Forest. It was hard to realize that a man in my own generation was wealthy enough to do that. Okay? Um, don't forget, Tom, Nick, Daisy, these people are all in their late 20s, early 30s. Tom and Nick, Nick at this point is 29. He turns 30 um, during the summer. Tom is a little bit older than him, but he's just so enormously wealthy, it's almost hard to understand. Nick continues, why they came east, I don't know. They had spent a year in France for no particular reason and then drifted here and there unrestfully. Listen to the words used to describe Tom and Daisy's marriage, right? They drifted here and there unrestfully wherever people played polo and were rich together. This was a permanent move, said Daisy over the telephone, but I didn't believe it. I had no sight into Daisy's heart, but I felt that Tom would drift on forever seeking a little wistfully the dramatic turbulence of some irrecoverable football game. Right, again, being described as drifting, seeking, right? Um, so again, we're talking about diction here. We ask, why are Tom and Daisy so unrestful? What do they seek? Right? All questions that we must ask ourselves. So we're going to pause here before we get into the next part. So pick it up next time when we will meet Tom and Daisy and Daisy's friend, Jordan Baker. <laughs>